adopted in the WIDA English language development standards. Um, also, as with all of our assessments, we recommend that high stakes decisions for students not be made solely on the basis of WIDA screener for kindergarten scores or test scores in general, but it certainly can help you distinguish between students who do need EL services versus those who don't. Uh, but again, it's an identification assessment. It's not intended to be used as a progress monitoring assessment, nor is it meant to be used as a diagnostic assessment. And it's not a summative assessment and cannot be used to replace uh, access for L's. So can't be used to make exit decisions for students, but can be used to make those identification decisions or to help with that process. All right, so, um, you know, this is what WIDA Screener Kindergarten or WIDA Screener for Kindergarten looks like. So we've developed it around an engaging single story and activities that go along with that story. It is a responsive test design, meaning it's an adaptive test. All domains are locally scored and it can be utilized as either a two domain oral assessment in which you just administer listening and speaking or as a four domain assessment uh, where you would also assess reading and writing and the students uh, decisions for the student would be made on the basis of an overall composite score. And I just wanted to mention whether or not educators give the two domain version and or the four domain version is entirely dependent upon state specific guidance. So you'll want to look to how Illinois uh, instructs you to use this assessment if and when it becomes allowable for use for screening students. Um, and whether you give two domain or four domain can also be somewhat dependent, again, based on state guidance, dependent upon where the student is in their schooling career at the point that they are screened. But just suffice to say that every state uh, in the consortium has their own unique entrance criteria. So I also want to mention this assessment was designed with educator feedback and specifically educator feedback from kindergarten educators, experts in, in that area. It was designed with that advice from the field very much in the forefront of our mind. So there's no fee for using this screener. Um, all assessment materials are available for local printing via the WIDA Secure Portal. And while we did develop the assessment in color on the advice of those experts, uh, since they advised that would be best for student engagement, um, we did field testing with grayscale as well. And so we found that this assessment can also be printed and administered um, in a grayscale version, and that works perfectly uh, fine as well. And students are not disadvantaged um, by engaging with the test in grayscale versus color. Um, like all of our assessments for kindergartners, this is a paper and pencil based test because we know that's what is most developmentally appropriate for this student group. And it's made to be administered to individual students. So this assessment will be administered with the TA just sitting next to one student as they work through the story. And and as I mentioned, the test is adaptive. And so that means it allows for you know, multiple opportunities for TAs to stop the test, um, both the domain tests and the overall test, um, once a student has reached their language proficiency ceiling in a given area or in the test as a whole. Um, and as I mentioned, this is also grounded in our WIDA English Language Development Standards. So it's not intended to assess kind of everyday conversational language that students, you know, use at home with their family or with their friends or on the playground. It's specifically designed to assess the kind of language that kindergartners will need to use to be successful in the classroom. So the language of schooling. It also has a very similar look and feel to kindergarten, as, uh, kindergarten access. So there are some new or different aspects to it, but, you know, primarily if you have uh, people in your state, your district, your school who are familiar with and have I administered kindergarten access, it should be pretty straightforward for them to 
get used to using WIDA screener for kindergarten. And then finally, you know, educators overwhelmingly expressed a desire to have a screener for this age group, you know, be relatively quick to administer and, you know, take no more than about 30 minutes per student to administer. And we believe that we have done that with case screener. The listening and the speaking uh, portion of the test takes about 10 to 20 minutes to administer, and that includes the few minutes that it takes for the test administrator to read through the storybook with the student. And only students at the very highest level of English language development who have the most uh, language to share with the TA and to demonstrate are going to be at that top end, that, that 20 minutes. Um, and then the reading and writing section of the assessment also takes about 10 to 20 minutes to administer as well. And again, as with all of our other assessments, this was developed in partnership with Cal and uh, so the Center for Applied Linguistics and it was subject to all of the same, you know, um, input from educator groups, uh, cognitive labs, we, we did some pilots with, you know, different uh, potential versions of the assessment. We did two rounds of field testing, bias and content sensitivity reviews, all of that good stuff. Um, so with that in mind, what you see in front of you um, is an example of the different pathways uh, that you can take in the test. So as I mentioned, this is an individually individually administered test, paper, pencil, takes a maximum of about 40 minutes to administer. And to give the test, the test administrator reads the story aloud, and then using the provided script, leads the student through a series of questions and activities that assess their listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills. And as you might anticipate, items get harder within each section. They start with proficiency level one and work their way up. Um, and we'll discuss those stopping rules um, that I mentioned a bit more later. But like I say, this visual is just um, from the TAM, the test administrator manual, and provides you with a visual for the flow of the test administration options. Um, so, and again, depending on the policy that is set in Illinois, you may be administering the oral language portion of the screener the entire screener or either or dependent upon the time of year. And this is also something that the TA is scoring in each, each domain locally as the student responds. So all of that is happening in real time. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, just some things to bear in mind to help you get ready for this assessment once that's something you are ready to do. So it's important, like I say, to know when and how to use the assessment in your particular state context in Illinois. So for general information about the assessment, you know, if you all want to go read a little more about it and, you know, just check some things out, you can do that um, on our public facing WIDA website by clicking at the assess tab um, at the menu at the top of the screen and then navigating to WIDA screener for kindergarten. So once it's available for use in Illinois, you will look at the Illinois member state page to find out when is it available, when should I be using it, um, you know, which version should I use in a given context, perhaps, and just all of the specific screening policies for Illinois will be shared on that member state page. So it's also obviously pretty important uh, to know where to find the training and test materials. So once you have access to those, they're going to be available, the training course and all of the test materials that you need, as well as instructions for how to print everything, is in the WIDA Secure Portal under Assessment Training. And then should you decide at your local level that you would like to purchase the professionally printed um, WIDA Screener for Kindergarten test kits, or if you would like to purchase any of the individual test materials, say like storybooks or 
or the cards that students use and manipulate during the test, you can also purchase those individually in the WIDA store. So in order to access that training course, once it's available, you're going to log into the WIDA Secure Portal. And so I've put arrows, you know, you use that nice blue login button that's at the top of every uh, page on the WIDA website, and that'll take you to our login page where you can log into the WIDA Secure Portal. Then you're going to navigate to assessment training, and you'll see here the uh, course and then you can also filter so it's easier to find um, and just filter by screener for kindergarten and then you will hit course details that will take you into the course where you'll enroll in the course and then at any time um, you can also click on course resources and that will give you links to all of the various resources that you will use um, you know to train to administer the test and then also in this instance to administer the test. Um, and you can find those resources also um, within the course itself. So to complete the training, the estimated training time is about three hours. Um, it is new with this training course. And I apologize, I just realized um, I got an old slide from somebody. It is not in Canvas. It's where I just showed you. It's in the WIDA Secure Portal, but it does indeed include videos of a mock test administration. And I apologize that just rolled over here not too long ago. Um, once you do complete that training, you'll be trained to administer the full four domain test. And you'll have taken two quizzes and those quizzes will now be embedded within the training course. You don't have to wonder, did I take everything that I'm supposed to take? I'm really not certain. Everything is all of one piece. And you'll have taken two quizzes, one on oral language, so listening and speaking and how to score that, and then one on the literacy portion for reading and writing. So once you finish the full course, you pass both quizzes, you have completed the course, and you are done. So I wanted to mention, you know, that's, that's a little different um, than our training courses in the past, where you might have to take separate quizzes outside the course. It's now all of one piece, which we think and hope makes it a little easier to know um, that you've done everything you need to do to be trained. Then after that, um, you will want to read the test administrator manual if you're going to administer this assessment. Um, and I, I want to mention, you know, it's not a repeat of the training course. It's not a simple how to. It actually provides, you know, writing samples and rubrics and just lots of essential information. And so, you know, if you're a district coordinator, you may just want to highlight that to your TAs so they know that it doesn't cover the same ground as the training course and that there are additional, you know, resources and materials in there that are going to be helpful to them um, in administering and scoring the assessment. So <clears throat> once you have access, you can check out those test materials under course resources. That's where the links to the printable versions of the TA script, which is reusable, the student storybook, the cards that are used as manipulatives during screening, the score sheets and the response booklet, those are all under course resources, but as I noted, kits and kit components are also available for purchase via the WIDA store. I did want to mention that all of those materials should be printed double sided and we recommend color printing, but as I noted, these can also be printed in black and white or in grayscale. Um, and <clears throat> so I wanted to just give a very, you know, brief overview of what the student, uh, you know, what the process entails. So to ease students into the screening process and make them feel comfortable, TAs will first invite them to listen to a really short, engaging, age-appropriate story that the test administrator reads aloud to the students. And you can see that on the screen there where it says new friends, that's the story. And the main characters are just a young elephant and a bird and they spend the day, you know, doing types of activities together that should be very familiar to the four and five, six-year-olds taking this test. So, you know, it goes over eating and playing, exploring the world around them. 
Um, and it provides them not just with pictures to engage in and pique their interest, but also there's actual stimulus for the test items and tasks to engage them. So the students interact directly with the pictures in the storybook and they interact directly with the manipulatives and the cards. Um, and then after reading that story, they'll go through those thematically related test items and tasks in either the oral domains or all four domains. As I noted, the test materials um, were developed in color. This was again on the advice of those expert kindergarten educator panels. Again, we recommend printing in color, you know, if and when this is possible, because they're more likely to be engaging to students in color. But again, we did field test the materials in both color and grayscale versions and found that student outcomes were equivalent. So we do feel confident that we can say, you know, if, if color printing is not available for some reason, students are not going to be disadvantaged if they take the test um, with grayscale printed test materials. So I wanted to quickly, you know, go over just some quick tips that we always provide about administering this particular test or, or any of our tests. So we do recommend, especially for this test with the one-on-one, -on -one, um, which is, you know, a bit different than the screener for grades one through 12, we recommend partnering with a colleague just to run through a, a practice test administration before giving uh, we to screener for kindergarten. We also recommend identifying your testing space and making sure again, that you've looked at the way that the training course and the TAM say that the materials should be laid out and just make sure that you have adequate space where you will be testing to lay out the cards and the storybook and, and everything like that. We also, you know, recommend that you schedule test sessions using our recommended test timing guidance, um, just so you make sure that you do have adequate time to screen an individual student, you know, and that you don't have any interruptions to the flow of testing with a given student. And then again, most important, just knowing your state and local policy, you know, being very clear which test domains you're to administer and what your identification and placement criteria are in Illinois in particular. Oh, I hopped ahead a little too far, sorry about that. Um, so another thing that we recommend before you launch into administering this assessment is to just be familiar with the stopping rules for the assessment. So, you know, the directions for stopping or moving on are gonna be on the right side of the scoring sheet. Um, and, you know, you total the scores, like this shows listening, you're going to total the scores after the student fish finishes testing, um, you know, but just do pay attention to those stopping rules, make sure, you know, especially if you have a student that is starting to struggle a bit, maybe reaching, you know, the top of um, their language proficiency threshold and what they have to demonstrate for you on that particular day, um, you know, you might want to take advantage of some of those stopping rules and places to wrap up. Um, we also have added some things we know that, you know, uh, scoring, speaking, and writing at the local level can feel a bit daunting sometimes. And so we've made sure to, you know, build in speaking practice activity um, to the training course to, you know, assist ed educators in feeling more comfortable with that. Um, and that's because, you know, the part where students retell um, is very important. And so that's something you could also bear in mind if you're working with kindergartners, you know, who are going to be taking the screener, um, you know, just bear in mind that that's something that the assessment asks them to work up toward. So, you know, like in listening, for example, it will prompt the student you know, the first task is just naming what's in the picture, then you're kind of level two and three tasks are to ask them to describe what's happening, um, describe any related personal experiences they have, or describe the experiences of others they know about that may be related. Then those four tasks, it's going to prompt them to describe in detail what they see in the picture cards. 
Um, and then speaking is going to end with asking them to retell the story. So that's why we say, you know, that that speaking retell and retail ability, um, you know, is, is an important part of the assessment. And the same sort of buildup that I just described, you know, occurs across the other domains and their task dom demands where it starts, you know, at that beginning um, proficiency level, proficiency level one, and then and kind of builds up, which is what allows it to be adaptive and lets the TA wrap up when a student has reached their threshold in a given domain. Again, we want, we know, you know, scoring writing, um, there's a lot of variables and things to bear in mind there. So we've built in that writing practice activity. And then again, just like with speaking, the extended writing task is going to be important and, you know, something that you can consider. Um, but again, it begins at this very, you know, easy, comfortable place to ease students into things, let them get comfortable with the test administrator and what's being asked of them. So writing actually begins with non score drawing activities, um, and then ask them, you know, to copy and then moves on up from there. Um, and only at level four and five is it going to include any writing beyond the word level. Okay, so some things to think about or bear in mind or be aware of where to find them after testing. So you enter student scores because you are scoring all domains locally. Um, you enter scores into a WIDA screener for kindergarten score calculator, and that generates your score reports. And I'm going to show you here in a moment where that can be found. Um, but I did want to mention, you know, some things to keep in mind. Only proficiency level scores are reported. So this is reported in the same, you know, one. 1.5 to 2.5, it's, it's reported in the same way that we just screener for grades one through 12 are reported. Um, and again, you're going to use specific scores that are used in Illinois to make EL identification decisions. So that, that entrance criteria and those cut scores are determined entirely by your state, not by WIDA. So again, that's why you're gonna to wanna to keep referring back to that Illinois member state page, um, the identification and placement guidance there once WIDA screener for kindergarten information is added to it. And then of course you can always check in with your um, folks at ISB, but it is intended to be used as, like we say, just one element in the decision-making process of identifying a student as an English language learner and being in need of language development support services. So as promised, here is where you can find the score calculator on the WIDA website. So, you know, you just go to this place on the public facing website, you don't even have to log in. And there is where you enter your student scores. So you can see it's very simple, just drop down menu style, and then you hit get score report and it generates score reports of the style that you see over there to the right. So it's pretty easy to just go in and input those scores and then generate the score reports. So here's a look at what it looks like. Uh, when student proficiency levels in the various domains and in the various composite scores are um, presented on the score report. So, you know, it's um, analogous again to the way that we a screener for grades one through 12 scores are reported. So the same domain level scores and composite scores um, with the same weighting um, for how those are factored for each of the given domains. So there is also now an interpretive guide addendum. So we put out since this, you know, kind of came out in mid spring and obviously our most recent WIDA screener um, interpretive guide was already released. Um, we have both that guide, which you would want to read the original guide, and then also read this interpretive guide addendum that's specifically for WIDA screener for kindergarten. And that will help you make sense of those student scores and you know, discuss them with students, families, colleagues, so on and so forth. 
Okay, so again, just one more time, you know, I want to emphasize lots of decisions being made at the state level. So your state decides if you can use K screener, K model, or KWAPT. For example, you know, Illinois does not use KWAPT. You are currently using K model um, and K model alone. So you would want to wait for the go ahead from your state department before incorporating use of K screener. Um, they will also decide whether you administer the oral component, just the listening and the speaking part of the test, or if you administer administer all four domains. And again, um, for some states, that's dependent upon the age of the student being screened and where they are in their schooling career. For example, a first semester first grader may take a different, you know, test than a first semester first grader, but that is entirely dependent upon state guidance. Um, your state also decides, usually, sometimes there's more local control, but the state generally advises um, or decides whether case screeners should be administered in color or not. Um, and then again, they determine those score cutoffs and other policy decisions around how you may use WIDA screener for kindergarten scores as part of a process for identifying a student as being in need of services or not. Um, but just wanted to emphasize again that there are a lot of those things that are very much state specific. And so you're going to want to make sure that you are bearing that in mind if and when you begin administering WIDA screener for kindergarten. All right. And that is all I have on that topic. Um, so now I'm going to move into talking about the WIDA English Language Development Standards Framework 2020 edition. So just a quick agenda overview. I'm going to discuss the significance of the 2020 edition, why we released you know, a new edition at this time. I'm going to introduce its design features. So I'm going to touch on things that are new and updated. Um, I'm going to briefly discuss some content area connection and collaboration resources that we've provided. And then we'll get to our Q&A portion. All right. So um, first up, I did want to talk about, you know, before I launch into discussing the updated framework, I just wanted to remind everybody that WIDA has moved away from the term English language learners, except where, you know, we are citing, say, maybe federal guidance that still may use that term. Um, so we only use that term when applied to meeting compliance with federal legislation now. And we prefer to use the term multilingual learners as much as possible, because we just consider that to to be a much more assets based um, term, one that really honors students multiple languages and just, you know, all the wonderful assets that multilingual learners bring to their schooling. Um, so we use this term to refer to all children and youth who are or have been consistently exposed to multiple languages um, throughout their lives and schooling. So, you know, why another edition of the standards? I mean, for starters, we feel like, you know, a lot has um, evolved and changed in the field of education since the 2012 amplification, which was the last edition of the standards was released. So primarily, you know, the 2020 edition was developed to keep current in theory and practice in language education, just to better align with existing academic content standards and disciplinary practices. And most of all, to really accentuate the assets of multilingual learners and put that we to can do philosophy, you know, very front and center in the standards. It has always existed, you know, as an underpinning in the standards, um, just like the big ideas that I'll talk about in a second have always been part of our standards. But in this edition, we really wanted, like I say, to be explicit and call out those big ideas in a very clear and meaningful way. So I also wanted to just briefly touch on, you know, what the standards framework is and what it is not. So it is meant to be a description of clear and measurable goals for learning. Um, it's meant to be a resource for state and district and school accountability, a guide for informing the design of linguistically and culturally sustaining curriculum instruction and assessment but it is not intended as a prescriptive document of how to teach. It's not a curriculum. It's not a book that you, you know, pick up and implement. 
um, in terms of like it being a course of study or a series of lessons. We very much hope you, you know, implement it, but it's not that kind of curriculum style implementation. And it's also not intended to be a basis for teacher evaluation or for grading of students at all. So as I mentioned, one of the main goals of this updated edition was, you know, transforming WIDA's can-do philosophy into these four big ideas. And these four big ideas, again, have always, you know, permeated and been part of our standards since the first edition was released in 2004, but we just really wanted to highlight these concepts and their importance in the 2020 edition and just reinforce them less as an underlying subtext and more as just explicit statements in the ways of which the WIDA theories and values permeate our standards. Um, and also, we just wanted to be clear why we think it's so crucial that these ideas of equity of opportunity and access, integration of content and language, collaboration among stakeholders, and functional approach to language development be the ones that are, you know, underpinning and driving work in the field. And that's because we know, you know, equity is essential for multilingual learners' preparation for college and career and civic lives. Um, we know that students develop, you know, content learning and language development that occurs concurrently. And, you know, you, you can't extricate those two. Academic content is the context for language learning in school and language is the means for learning that academic content. And so, you know, they are inextricably intertwined and we believe that you have to have a focus on both because increased facility in one improves facility in both and focus on one, at, you know, and, and leaving out the other um, can cause, you know, deleterious effects in, in either or both areas. We also believe, you know, stakeholders really need to share responsibility for e educating multilingual learners and that that collaboration is just essential for multilingual learners and really all students to thrive linguistically and academically. And then that functional approach to language development just focuses on language as a toolbox, you know, language as this toolbox to which students can add different tools for communicating and developing relationships and just acting upon and interacting with the world, forging their identity and making their identity known in the world. Um, and we hope that that focus helps educators focus on that purposeful use of language, language for meaning making sake, so that it will help educators explicitly teach students how language works in different situations and sociocultural contexts and how they can manipulate and change it to meet different purposes. So, you know, it's not that vocabulary and grammatical structures and things like that don't have an important place in language learning, but we believe that focusing on language learning, you know, beyond that kind of static inventory of structures is really important for students who understand the importance of their own language development and to be invested in adding tools to their toolbox. So next up, I'm going to cover some of the de design features of the 2020 edition. So the WIDA ELD standard statements, those, those five standard statements, language for social and instructional purposes, language for mathematics, language for English language arts, for science, for social studies, those still have remained the same and they represent that broad conceptual framing of language and content integration. And the reason I'm mentioning that they stayed the same is it is important that those have remained unchanged, those five core statements since the 2004 edition. So all editions have had those same statements. This edition retains those statements and it's simply the supporting framework and ancillary materials around those standards that has been changed and updated to, you know, just to facilitate greater understanding and utilization of the standards themselves. So next in the nested graphic, and we're kind of moving in in specificity as we move in in the graphic, we go to key language uses. And these are just 
prominent language uses across disciplines. And those four key language uses of narrate, explain, inform, and argue were developed because um, the standards development team, you know, did a, a wide review of both academic standards and other existing language development standards and the literature around all those standards. And they looked at the language demands that students are, you know, the things students are being asked to do with language across multiple grade levels and contexts. And they identified these four high leverage genre families, these four things, you know, that are really prominent across all the different grade levels and disciplines. Students are asked to do these things with language, over and over and over, regardless of their age and regardless of the content area they are working in. So that's why we've used those four key language uses as the primary organizational feature of the 2020 edition. Then we move in again and we have our language expectations. Those are goals for content driven language learning and I will show you an example of those here in a minute, but basically those are the statements that are going to look the closest to what uh, educators who are used to looking at academic content standards will be used to and it will help them identify, you know, this is the standard that the student uh, is being asked to work on. Here's the content area we're working in. Here is the primary thing they're being asked to do with language in this unit or lesson. So here's the key language use we're going to focus on. And then here are the specific expectations of this, uh, you know, set of learning goals. So then um, our most specific, we have our proficiency level descriptors, and those are charts that represent continua of language development across the six levels of English language proficiency um, that WIDA uses for all of our products and services. So it's that same six levels of proficiency um, in the proficiency level descriptors that we use for access. So again, I, and I've already touched upon this, the standard statements themselves have remained the same, but I did want to point out one key tweak, which is that we have changed the abbreviations for the standard statements by just one word. So prior editions, we said language of, language of social and instructional purposes, language of science. And now again, to hone in on that focus on language as a tool, we have changed it to language for. So this is the language that students need for this area. And so small, but you know, purposeful change. We also have repositioned standard one and it just where it fits into um, all, you know, how it fits with all the other standards. So while the standard itself, language for social and instructional purposes, remains the same, we are now being clear that we consider standard one to be taking place all the time. So, you know, this is kind of um, the standard where there's that relational piece. There is, you know, getting to know the student as an individual and discussing things with them from, you know, their specific set of assets, their specific worldview and experiences, things like that. And so standard one is for all language proficiency levels, all grade levels, all content areas. It's used across all the different topics and tasks and situations. And so we just consider it to be functioning in conjunction with standards two through five. So when educators are identifying goals for students, they're always gonna have standard one and then whichever other content-based standard they are working on with that student, those two are gonna be coupled together because we know that the type of language um, you know, that's part of standard one drives the discussion and learning in those content specific standards. So as I mentioned previously about the key language uses, there is narrate, inform, explain, and argue, and they just represent um, our team's systematic analysis of all those different academic content standards and the literature around them. And we hope that by identifying these as the four key things that, like I say, students are asked to do all the time in school, um, you know, from kindergarten through 12th grade, 
all day long, every day. And so we hope that by identifying, hey, these are the main things that we're asking students to do with language, that it'll help bring focus and coherence to what we mean by the language of schooling. Because we understand, you know, language is a, is a vast sea and the language of schooling is, a, you know, only a smaller sea within that. And so we hope that that helps educators pinpoint more, okay, this is what I need to focus on when I focus on the language development piece of this content area lesson. And we hope that'll really help you prioritize and organize that content and language integration and make it you know, clearer for everyone. All right. Um, and I briefly wanted to show you some examples of what do I mean by, you know, high leverage genre families. So genres are just multimodal types of text. So that's oral, written, visual. Um, we're not just, you know, um, concerned with like written or oral language, but also all the other things that students use for input. But they are multimodal types of texts that, like I say, recur really frequently for very specific purposes. And because they have specific purposes, they also come with their own specific set of linguistic and organizational features. So examples would be things like biographies and scientific reports. So genres within a genre family have similar features. Like, for example, when we're looking at that top level of narrate, and we're looking at biographies and short stories and novels, we know that they do some similar things with language, and so they are grouped into a genre family. And we also know we use really common language patterns, for example, when we're asked to craft an argument or to narrate a story. And so again, that's why we have the KLUs as the organizational structure for this edition. So next up, um, I'm gonna talk about the language expectations and their reference codes. So again, these represent goals for content-driven language instruction, and they help educators and students identify the language that a student is going to need to be able to interpret or produce to meet a given content standard. And it just helps make visible and explicit those really common language patterns through a set of language functions and example language features that we have for each of the language expectations. So as you can see, I mentioned we have codes for the language expectations that look very similar to the type of academic content coding that we see for those standards. So we're looking at an example here that is ELD standard language for language arts. Um, in our hypothetical situation, we're working with a second or third grader on narrating in the expressive mode, which would be you know, uh, speaking and or writing. And so the language expectation is that multilingual learners are going to construct a language arts narrative. That's what they're being asked to do. So obviously our key language use is narrate. And in order to meet this expectation and construct a narrative, we know that there are some language functions that a student is going to have to be aware of and potentially employ. And that's what these bullets are. So we know that to narrate a story, a student has to orient their audience to the context for their story. They have to develop their story by letting us know, you know, timing and setting and the sequence of events, um, you know, what the main problem is, how things are resolved at the end. And then we would also want them to be thinking about the specific tools that they're pulling out of their language toolbox and using in a way that engages and adjusts for audience. So again, we hope that, you know, helping educators identify the standard, the grade cluster, the key language use, and the mode that students are working in for a given unit or lesson will, again, just bring a lot of focus and coherence to what we mean when we say there needs to be an integration of language development and language learning into content area lessons. 
Then next up, I just wanted to provide another um, example language function so that I could show you some sample language features and what I mean by those. So another function of crafting a narrative and you know, either telling it orally or writing it down, like I say, would be you know, developing those time and event sequences. And in order to do that, some of the language features that students might use to get to that function would be they need to be able to use some verbs to tell us what their characters are doing or thinking or feeling. And they're also going to have to use connecting words to help orient us in time and know when events are happening. So I hope these examples help make it clear that again, language functions are just those common patterns of language use that showcase the ways students might use language to meet the given purposes of schooling and the features are things like the different types of sentences or clauses or phrases or words that a student may use based on, you know, their English language proficiency level, where they are in their development, the number of tools in their toolbox. They may use different features and functions to get to a given expectation. Next up, we um, have those proficiency level descriptor charts. Um, as I said, they articulate what multilingual learners' growth might look like across those levels of English language proficiency. Um, and they are aligned to the sixth grade level clusters that we use for access. And they're broken out into three different dimensions of language. So we look at what students might be doing at the discourse level and discourse is actually broken out into some different um, specific areas like organization, coherence of language, density of language, you know, so we kind of break down discourse into those different areas. And then we also look at the sentence and word phrase level. And then that gives you an idea with these continua of Okay, I have a student in a given grade level cluster. Here are some of the things that they are currently able to do with language. Here are some of the things we want them to be able to do with language. And you can kind of orient yourself as to where a given student might be in their language development at a given time that you're working with them. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over additional supporting materials so I can make sure we have at least, you know, eight to 10 minutes for Q&A. So we do have a lot of additional supporting materials in the 2020 edition itself. There is a really great section on collaborative planning for content and language integration. Um, and that showcases a hypothetical scenario where we have a seventh grade science teacher working with an English language development specialist, and you see them working through a given unit and deciding, okay, here's the standard, here are the key language uses we need to target, and just it walks through their planning process and provides a map for educators to use when they're at each of the same steps that those hypothetical educators are at. It provides guiding questions that content specialists and language specialists can use when they're planning together, um, and we just hope that'll be very supportive of those collaborative conversations. Then if you want to know more about the key language uses, why they are what they are, the theory behind them. We have key language uses, a closer look. We know that we use a lot of terminology, so we have a glossary to, to help you, um, you know, know what we're talking about when we use various terms. And then there are eight different appendices and they're for a wide variety of different specific audiences. So there are things targeted, you know, at helping SEAs meet the demands of ESSA, um, there is a section you can read more about the theoretical foundations of this edition, why the big ideas are what they are, so on and so forth. Then we also have uh, three different pages on the WIA website, so the public facing website, where you can find out more information about our standards in general and also this edition. So we have a WIDA ELD standards framework page where you can learn more about the big ideas and each of the framework components. The 2020 edition page, um, that's where you can find out more about this specific edition as well as a wealth of supporting resources for both rollout, implementation, and also just entry level understanding of the standards and their different components. There are things like FAQs. Um, there's a nice two pager that summarizes that collaborative conversation that I was just talking about on the last slide. Um, so if you want to introduce the idea of collaborative conversation,
conversations uh, with your colleagues. That's a nice little one pager for that. And then we also have our standards professional development page where you can learn about specific opportunities and webinars and resources to support your understanding and use of the framework in the 2020 edition. We also have our WIDA ELD Standards News Voices from the Field series. Um, I would encourage you to check this out. It's just a series that presents ideas and practices and tools for educators as they begin exploring the 2020 edition, begin looking at you know, avenues for implementation. Um, and you can subscribe to that in the WIDA Secure Portal under uh, Manage My Profile News Subscription Preferences. Once you log into the WIDA Secure Portal, Portal, that blue manage button is going to be in the upper right corner. Um, Illinois has also opted, opted into our self-paced e-workshop package. So there is an e-workshop that's available to Illinois educators now, uh, the WIDA ELD Standards Framework, a collaborative approach. And then also uh, the International Consortium is offering their International Virtual Institute. That's available on demand and you can register for that at any time. I know that it is for the International Consortium as opposed to the Domestic Consortium, um, but if that's something that interests you, there's a wealth of information about the standards in that institute um, that would be applicable for the domestic consortium. There's also other ways to stay connected with us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. You can also always visit our website or email our help center or customer service center at help at WIDA.us. You're also, um, you know, able to reach out to your state education agency folks um, and they can pass along things to us if you need help. We also have our WIDA Facebook groups. We have our educator exchange, um, as well as our supporting success for multilingual learners with disabilities. Those are just spaces for educators to share ideas and resources and engage in discussions. And um, our, our customer service center does monitor those pages and things like that. Um, so that's a great way to engage with other educators across the consortium. And now we have some time for Q&A. And if we have more questions than we have time, I'll be happy to answer questions via email as well. Okay, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a full house here uh, at the uh, Balmoral Ballroom. So as I said earlier, if there's anybody who has a question, the easiest way, frankly, will be for you to come up here and come up to the mic and ask Elizabeth a question. So. Any takers here? So can you come up here, sir? And we have about uh, five, six minutes. So this way, Elizabeth will be able to hear you. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, when will ass WIDA assessment tools uh, be aligned with the WIDA, the new ELD framework? That Both is identification and then annual assessment tools. Um, I can't speak to identification because it's access that goes first. I do know that the plan is there will not be a fully aligned access test to this edition until at least 2024 25. Um, so, you know, it's in that same kind of longer range development process that we have anytime we are realigning. So Cal and WIDA are, you know, actively working on that realignment process. And then of course we have to develop items, field test items, you know, analyze the data from the field testing. So it will be some time until access is fully aligned to this new edition, but that process is going to be gradually taking place over time between now and like I say, about 2025. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, mm -hmm. Any other questions? And there was also a lot of, um, as these standards were developed, there was a lot of underpinning and work with Cal going on as well to kind of have some internal, you know, bridging or at least thought about how we're going to move from one to the other. Any other questions? I'm scanning the audience, Elizabeth. 
Um, there, it looks like there's one more, but I would ask you to please come up here. So. So Elizabeth, I don't know if you can answer this or not uh, because it's specific to Illinois, but has okay. Illinois officially adopted these standards? No, um, it is an ongoing process at this time. So, yeah. mm -hmm. right, so and, and just, in, and just in real, process. <laughs> it is in process, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, but it's it's not official, and uh, no, uh, it has to go through a process of. Uh, getting accepted into rules and regs, which requires the Illinois State Board of Education to get involved, etc. Yes. As does use of weed as screener for kindergarten. Just wanted to emphasize. Right. Uh, any other questions? We have about mm, about two or three minutes left. Okay, come on up. This is like let's make a deal. <laughs> That requires some I'm bravery. really dating myself with that reference. <laughs> hey, hello. Hi. I think you have answered uh, this um, at the beginning of the section. I mm -hmm. just wanted to double check and make sure. Uh, when talking about the with the screener, um, we have a new version and we're still using the old one. So right. Yeah, I would, like I say, I would refer right now, you need to refer to the Illinois State Member page, the 2021-22 Identification and Placement Guidance. You all have not um, moved into using WIDA Screener for kindergarten just yet. For the age group that I'm talking about, the allowable assessment is still kindergarten model. So I think I'm sharing today, you know, with Illinois having an eye toward moving to a screener for kindergarten, but my understanding is it's not yet allowed for use because again, it has to go through that being adopted into the rules and regulations process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll add, um, Barry Pedersen is gonna be here tomorrow. So I'm sure Barry can also answer both screener and access questions as well. Absolutely. So I like it. He'll relay them back to me as well, too, as needed. So if, if something occurs to people, you can ask Barry and he can pass it along to me. Right. He, he's a good point of contact and state. OK, I would say we probably have literally 60 seconds left. <laughs> Any burning questions? Come on up. Burning better be burning. Um, what is the difference between the proficiency level descriptors and the MPIs from the 2012 edition? Well, so the MPIs were just a K through 12, right? They just one set of MPIs. And what we heard repeatedly from educators in the field is we need that broken out across the different grade level clusters. You know, we need to see the continua across those different levels. And so, you know, it's broken out across the different grade level clusters. And there's also more specificity at the discourse level than there was with the MPIs. But those, you know, are considered at least retired, semi retired, because the PLDs offer that grade level specificity. All right. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. We were recording this session. I uh, must admit, uh, oh, you're getting applause, Elizabeth, so. Oh, thanks everybody. I love, you know, I love a chance to work with educators more directly. And I apologize that I couldn't be there in person with you all today, but thank you so much for attending. Thank you for all of your questions. And like I say, if you have any subsequent burning questions, um, you know, maybe just let uh, Barry or Trevor or Joanne know, and I know that they'll reach out to me if need be. Right. And thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, and we were recording this session, so you'll be also, be, and it'll be back uploaded to our portal. Thanks so right. much, Elizabeth. You have a Bye. great afternoon. You too. Bye -bye. Have a great day, everybody.